So um, thanks for coming, everyone. You can you hear me okay? Yeah. So um, um, what would happen if I failed? I mean, this talk is supposed to be about the importance of failure, but what if this talk were a total flop? The talk itself is a failure. Would that make the talk a success since the talk is about failure? Probably not. It would probably suck. It would probably mean everyone here knows I'm a total loser. And I wouldn't like that. You probably wouldn't like that. It would probably feel really bad. But you know what? Before I got OK enough at public speaking, I've given some talks that really totally sucked. It made it really obvious that I was really terrible and a failure at public speaking. And it still feels really terribly, horribly embarrassing when I think of those talks. But you know what else? If I uh, didn't give those talks, and it's only by giving those talks and failing spectacularly at them that I learned from them, and I got OK enough at public speaking to be here today. Here's a fact. You can't do anything cool in your life without failing. You can't. You have to fail in order to do cool things. In China, where I go every year, I travel a lot, I saw this incredibly cool sign. I thought it was incredibly cool. And in China, this is a place where failure is amazingly shameful, much more than most places in the world. The sign in a primary school full of little kids, had a, it said, every master was once an amateur. And it's true. You can't become a master at anything without starting from the beginning. At the beginning, even if you're way talented, you'll suck at it. But if you put your 10,000 hours into doing whatever it is you're doing, uh, you'll make lots of mistakes. You'll make the, uh, lots of failures along the way. It's frustrating, but it's part of learning. And after you've put in your 10,000 hours, you'll be really glad that you went through all you went through learning from all your mistakes, which are a necessary part of the process. So failure is kind of complex, but there's, and there's many aspects to it. One big, ugly aspect of failure is feeling shame. Let me tell you just a little bit, a little bit about shame in my life. The first half of my life was nothing but hopeless, miserable depression. It's true. I was a total failure at life. I was beaten daily by bullies, often as gym teacher watched. Are gym teachers as bad here as they are in the United States? Anyways. Uh, as a little kid, you know, what did I know? I blamed myself for all this. Uh, I felt I deserved my misery. To avoid my pain, when I got home, I retreated into the magical world of television. Kids on TV, unlike me, were beautiful, had loving parents, understanding friends, problems that resolved by the end of the show. It was so depressing. I became more depressed, only to become more of a target at school, only to retreat more into TV again when I got home. Yes, I am a TV addict. And um, part of my life. But also to avoid my pain, I retreated into doing lots of way geeky things when I got home taking things apart to see how they worked, and sometimes being able to put them back together again. And sometimes, even when I put them together again, even if there were extra parts left over, which there often were, it sort of worked again. And maybe it even did something a little bit different, and I thought that was cool. But doing these geeky things was totally solo, totally on my own, not with other kids. I was just on my own, and this is part of the reason why all these bullies would beat me up all the time and torment me for being who I am. So this was another fail. 
when you're depressed, everything leads to fail. Everything's, everything feels shameful. Everything sucks. When I first started taking those things apart and unable to put them back together again, this seemed a total failure. I was a failure again. I felt like a failure, full of shame. Every failure filled me with more shame. It all reminded me of why I was being bullied or why I believed I was being bullied, proving what a miserable snot I really was, or so I believed. But eventually, as I was saying, after enough of this, years really, I learned to put things back together, in way, uh, back together again in interesting ways, and this really did feel great. I now know that putting things together, even if it's not the way it's supposed to be, is called hacking. I learned to hack through lots and lots of failures. Hacking is all about failures. Hacking is taking anything that exists as a resource, using them for your projects, even if you use them not as intended, and then learning from it and sharing the results. This is hacking. We can hack anything. Anything can be used for this. We can even hack ourselves. And we should hack ourselves. Another aspect of failure is unexpected results. You expect one thing by what you're doing, but something else happens. It's different. It feels like a failure. But to hack well, you need to try stuff. It's totally fine if you have no idea how things will work out. You try it because you want to, just to see what happens. And whether or not things come out as expected, as intended, it's totally unimportant. Regardless of the outcome, you'll learn from your experience. And this is not just okay, it's really cool. This is also exactly what science is all about. The scientific method is you make a hypothesis, you set up an experiment to test your hypothesis, and then you learn from the result, whether it came out as expected or not. And then you can try more experiments if you like. Um, if you try an experiment and you require an outcome, uh, if you try an experiment and you require the outcome to be what you expect, this is not good science. In fact, this isn't even science. It's bad science, maybe, but it's not science. Good science requires that you are open to the outcome, whether it's expected, what you're expecting or not. Whatever the outcome is, hopefully you'll learn from it. You can choose to learn from it. And if you like, you can come up with a new hypothesis and test that with a new experiment. Science like hacking, requires lots of failures. Before coming up with useful theories, you've got to try things again and again, and it will come out uh, uh, unexpected almost all the time. This is how we learn. This is how science progresses. We can do science on anything as well. I do science on myself. I use my life as a laboratory to run experiments on myself. Up until a certain point in my life, all of the choices that I made were based solely on what I thought others wanted from me. It was only what I thought others wanted. I was too depressed to make choices based on what I wanted. I didn't even know what I wanted. All I knew that I wanted was not to be depressed. That wasn't much to go on. I um, eventually, though, made a choice for myself. Eventually, I realized that though I watched hours and hours and hours of TV every day, and did this day after day, week after week, month after month, I realized that I actually didn't like TV. And I asked myself, so why do I do this every day? And I knew the answer. The answer was, I don't know. But I did know that I didn't have to continue. So I quit. That was easy. And 
It was awful. Suddenly, I had so much time. All those hours I used to spend watching TV, now I had time to just sit there and feel all this stuff that was so unconscious before that I just pushed away and it all came screaming into consciousness. It sucked. Fail. <laughs> at least it felt like a failure, <clears throat> but only at first. I noticed one really important thing from this. I made a choice for myself, and it had a huge impact on my life which brought up a hypothesis. If I made choices based on what I thought might make my life better, perhaps over time, with enough trial and error in making these choices and learning from them, perhaps life would get better. Worth a try. Um, after plenty of experimenting on myself, I started getting results. It took a long time but I eventually learned to live a life that was pretty cool. I could make a living after a while working as a consultant doing all this geeky electronic stuff for small companies. I could actually even make enough money in a few months to live the rest of the year. And I thought that was pretty cool. But after about a decade of this, I had the bright idea of starting my own company in Silly Valley. Well, Silicon Valley, but whatever. Uh, I started a company called Threeware. We made RAID controllers. We had uh, free uh, software drivers. And, um, you know, don't worry about it if you don't know what those are. But uh, it seemed like a really cool way to make enough money to live off of. Uh, at least it did until the VCs took over the company. Uh, VCs in English, that's venture capitalist, also known as vulture capitalists for very good reasons. Vulture capitalists, there we go, they, they ensure that they get at least 51% of your company, they take over, and then they start making terrible decisions that they think are good ones, and when you complain, they fire the founders. That's what VCs do. But anyways, I'll stop ranting about them. I managed not to get fired because I quit before they could fire me. And I went back to being a consultant, which was pretty cool. But after a little bit of this, a little bit more of this, I wanted more than just a pretty cool life. I wanted to live a life I love. A life I really love living, a, a, a life that gets me out of bed in the morning wondering how, what problems I can solve and what things I can do with all of that. Working and just having a pretty cool job wasn't that. So I came up with the notion of doing an experiment on myself to s check out my hypothesis. What if I could explore what I love in my life, make time to explore and do, uh, do uh, explore what I love in my life so I could actually try doing what I love in my life. And then maybe that thing, or maybe a bunch of things, could make me enough money doing what I love so that I could keep doing what I love. And that would be my definition of success. So the experiment that I tried was to save a year's worth of money. I was lucky enough to be able to do that. A uh, year's worth of living expenses, and then for a year, I decided that I would only choose to do what I love. I would only do something if I believed that I would love it. Um, of course, I still had to do laundry, but uh, for the mo most part, I wanted to do only what I love. What would life be like if I only did things I loved for one year? including the work that I do, the work for money. That notion is actually, that was scary. How would I make money again? Would anyone ever hire me again after saying no to people just because I don't love the work they're offering me? I didn't know. But if I didn't quit doing things that were just okay, I wouldn't have enough time to explore, let alone do what I love. I didn't know what that would be. I certainly didn't know how I'd make money doing this. But since I didn't know what to do, I started off by doing a bunch of volunteer work that I knew I loved. 
didn't make me any money, but I knew I loved it, so I did it. And to see if I could make money doing the volunteer work, I took a class on grant writing and spent several months writing grants to fund some of the volunteer work that I did that I knew that I loved. But I soon realized that I wasn't loving grant writing. In fact, I really hated grant writing. So I chalked up that as a failure. I stopped grant writing and I focused on geeky electronic projects that I'd been working on or playing with and thinking about. But I hadn't been putting much energy into playing with this electronics because when I worked in electronics all day, I didn't want to come home so much and play with it. But I had plenty of time now to do what I thought I might love. And these electronic projects that I thought I would love were worth trying. And TV Be Gone is the one project that really got on a roll. The idea for TV Be Gone, and TV Be Gone, for those that don't know, is an electronic keychain that turns TVs off in public places. That's all it does. I wanted one. I became obsessed with doing this. Uh, I wanted to turn off TVs everywhere I went. And it really did get on a roll. And the idea for TV Be Gone is actually very simple conceptually. It would simply transmit TV off codes. TV off codes are just invisible light blinking on and off at just the right rate to be an off code for a TV. If I could collect the off codes for the most popular TVs and transmit all of them one right after the other, it would turn off TVs. That would be it. What could be simpler? Well, what I thought would take me maybe a few weeks ended up taking me a year and a half to accomplish. That was unexpected. Therefore, that is a fail. But it didn't feel like a fail. It felt great. But since I was obsessed with getting all of these off codes, I did whatever I needed to do, and that included recording the off codes from universal remote controls that I bought. But back in 2003, when I was doing this, logic analyzers were $10,000, which I couldn't afford. That was kind of frustrating, so I made my own. I was obsessed with this, so I did whatever was necessary, and it felt great, so I kept doing it. Um, and that took several more months. Uh, and since I kept loving this, I kept at it, and I eventually made the prototype work. It really worked. It enabled me to go around San Francisco, where I live, turning off TVs in public everywhere I went, and enjoying the hell out of it. And of course, all my friends saw me doing this, and they all wanted one. They're my friends. Of course, I expected that, so uh, I figured I'd make one for them. But, of course, they told all their friends, and many of them wanted one, and I couldn't make one for everybody. Uh, and many of those friends told their friends, and so there were friends of friends of friends, and many of these people all wanted TV Be Gone's, and then I thought, wow, maybe this is an opportunity. And I took a gamble, and I actually made as many of these things as I could afford, which was 20,000. That cost a bunch of money, but I had it. And what else was I going to do with this money except do something that I thought I might love? And I did the math, and I figured that if I sold 5,000 of those, that I would break even. I wouldn't lose any money if I sold 5,000 of the 20,000. And uh, if it took five years or whatever, I don't really care. And then there would be 5,000 people going around all over the world turning TVs off, making the world a better place for everybody. I thought that'd be pretty cool. Well, as it turned out, I sold all 20,000 in three weeks. And it's the only way I've made money since 2004. That is an unexpected result. And therefore, it's a fail. But what a successful failure that is, and my life has never been the same ever since. Since then, I've been doing what I love, and by doing what I love, I make enough to keep doing what I love. This is a success. But this success is also unexpected results, as I said. In addition to what I've said, it's an unexpected result because it came from my TV addiction. It came from my geekiness, which I used to think was all solo and why I was getting beaten up. These two things that I thought were totally wrong with me, that led me nothing to misery. 
led to my first spectacular successful invention, TV Be Gone. This unexpected result, as with all unexpected results, has to be considered a failure, which is also a success. How would you want to look at that? I want to encourage all of you to fail early and fail often. It's really actually quite important. You need to take risks to live a life you love living. You need to try things that you might suck at. You need to allow yourself to fail and fail a lot. You can hack yourself. Maybe it's scary, but please make choices for yourself. See what happens. And if you like, you can learn from what happens. And then you can make new choices. What if you make those choices best on the, uh, to the best of your ability on what you believe might make your life a little bit better? What would happen? Some choices might get unexpected results. Some choices make, make, might, the results of some choices might make you feel full of shame. But you can, if you like, learn from the results. And then you can make new choices. You now know a lot more, so the new choices might work out a little better. Maybe, maybe not. You can see and learn from it and then make new choices based on what you believe might make your life a little bit better. And then, maybe, hopefully, probably, over time, you will look back from where you are, from where you were, through all the failures and successes in between, which led you to where you are now, living a life you love because of the choices you made. Envision that. The choices you made made all of this happen. Choice is a very powerful thing. So please, choose well what you do with the time of your life. Thanks for your time. If you ever want help quitting a job you don't like, talk to me.